Greetings, everyone. Um, I want to teach you two Nepali words today. The first word is Didi. D-I-D-I -D -I means elder sister. The second word is Ama. A-M-A -A means mother. Didi and Ama, elder sister and mother. Simple. These simple words, yet two such powerful words um, when it comes to Maggie's story. A story where Maggie Didi became Ama to over 50 children and in the process inspired thousands of others like me. In, it is 2005, Maggie is in her gap year. After completing high school in New Jersey, she's traveled halfway across the world to Nepal, a country ravaged by poverty, civil war, and political unrest. Fate takes her to a small Himalayan village where she sees Hema, a little girl breaking rocks by the side of the road. The girl looks up to her and says, Namaste, Didi. And that is how Maggie Doyne's story started. At age 19, Maggie used her life savings to build a home for the orphaned children. A home, not an orphanage. Her family in Nepal that started with a few of her children grew as time went on. But that wasn't enough for this champion. In 2010, she opened a school for the area's impoverished children, one that would, ones that would not get any education had it not been for Maggie. The school now serves over 500 students. To sustain, grow, and support her efforts in Nepal, Maggie created the Blink Now Foundation uh, with a mission to help uh, people make a difference at just a blink of an eye, this foundation serves now as a vehicle to share ideas and her passion. In 2013, Maggie received the Forbes Excellence Award in Education. In 2014, she was honored by the Dalai Lama as an unsung hero of compassion. In 2015, Maggie was named CNN Hero of the Year. I could list on and on, but we'd be here the whole night. Ladies and gentlemen, Without further ado, we have a true champion among us today. A Didi that went on to become Ama to 54 children. An ever grateful, positive, and a truly inspiring hero. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Maggie Doyne. Hi everyone, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here today and I want to thank the Rollins College community and the students and the board and everyone for having me at the Winter Institute Speaker Series. It's such an honor. Um, I spent my day on campus today with the young people here, younger than me, <laughs> and um, I was left feeling so hopeful. Um, there are some world change makers in here, and uh, it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to tell my story and my journey um, with the hopes of telling it and sharing it, um, and then opening it up for some more conversation about children and our world and how we can make this place better. To kind of paint a picture of me, Maggie, um, I was very much your average, typical New Jersey girl. I was a soccer player. I was one of three sisters. I grew up um, with a trampoline in my backyard in a little house on a cul-de-sac with a mom and a dad. Um, and I went to a really amazing public school that I'm really proud of. And everything in suburbia, as I was growing up, was about college, college, college. You have to be successful and work really hard and do well on your SATs and take AP courses and be a good athlete so that you can go to a good college and maybe get a scholarship and then get on a fast track to success. And I took that very seriously. Um, I think I had college written on my forehead. At least that's what my guidance counselor would have thought. <clears throat> And um, at the very last moment, I was a senior in high school. You're about to make a commitment for college. I was playing in a county championship for lacrosse. And 
taking my AP tests and doing the SATs and everything I was supposed to do. And I woke up one morning and I thought, wow, I know so much about soccer and um, suburban New Jersey and AP history and all of the books that I've read, but I know nothing about what's inside of me and who I am and what I want to be. And I don't know if I can make this investment in college and university without learning a little bit about who this person is on the inside. So I walked downstairs to my parents in that living room and I said, Mom, Dad, I think I want to go on a gap year. I want to travel. I want to see the world outside of suburban New Jersey um, and just take some time to learn about myself. Um, and what else is out there. So I signed up for a gap year program. I end up traveling all throughout the South Pacific Islands. My passion is ignited for my education. I am teaching Fijian children in a sea village and rebuilding a seawall. I'm meditating with Buddhist monks and doing an outdoor survival class in <laughs> the mountains of New Zealand. It was everything I could have ever wanted in a gap year program. And for my second semester, I end up in northeastern India. Um, again, just by chance, it was a semester program. And um, I start to work in a program that's serving Nepalese refugees. Now, at 18 years old, I couldn't have even identified where Nepal was on a map. I had, I knew a little bit about Mount Everest, but I had no idea where it was geographically northeast of India. Um, and I had no idea that there had been a 15-year civil war that had ensued, creating approximately one million orphan children. Um, but I started to meet children across the border in India and hear their stories. And I started following the news and the events and kind of just asking myself the question, why? And um, I didn't like orphanages at all. I hated them. They were these dark, dismal places where you'd get a little bit of slop on your plate every day. It's no place that a child would want to grow up. And my wheels started turning, and I met a young girl, here she is, named Sunita. Sunita had left her village in Nepal about six years prior, like many of the children that I was meeting in India. and. As I learned her story, the two of us start talking about taking a trip to Nepal. Um, it was 2005, and the border had just opened up, and there was peace, there was a UN armistice, and the two of us, Sunita and I, decide that we want to go and find her village and find where she came from. Her family had been displaced as a result of the war. So we go on a trip. Um, we get on a bus for 28 hours and cross over the Nepali border on an ox cart. And then we get on another bus at the border that takes us up north through the foothills. We get on another bus that takes us up into the Himalayan mountains. And eventually a driver looks back and says, girls, it's time to get off now. This is the end of the road and points us to a footpath. Um, Sunita and I proceed down this footpath, or up rather. It was the most difficult, arduous journey of my entire life. Um, I think two and a half days walking, being passed, of course, by women with baskets and bare feet and <laughs> so much stronger than I had ever known, and goats and scatterings of the most beautiful Himalayan villages in the mountains. Um, one of the most beautiful places that I'd ever seen. Ultimately, we end up in a village called Odanoku, which we soon come to find is Sunita's village. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, the entire village relies subsistently on what they grow subsistently. So that's rice paddy, and the river down at the bottom of the mountain is the water where people go and fetch for their dishwashing and their drinking water and their weekly bath. Um, life was so simple and the people were so strong. Um, you'd see five-year-old children caring for their siblings and 
up late at night, the women would tell stories by the fire. And I found a piece of myself there that I, I had never really discovered before. Um, but there was also the stark contrast of civil war and unrest and loss and family separation and a school that had been completely shut down by Maoist rebels and the tin that had fallen off the roof, making the school uninhabitable, and the books that hadn't arrived in years, and um, the children who had lost everything. So I leave this village after two weeks just feeling like, wow, something's here for me in this amazing country. Um, and I continue to travel, and I continue to meet children who are affected by civil war. Um, this is a child porter who's carrying about 160 pounds of load on her back. And um, the life of a child who loses parents or is forced to work. And <clears throat> you know, you meet eyes with these young people and children. And I think I really just saw myself. I saw, you know me as a 12 year old except I was going to my first dance and jumping on that trampoline and playing soccer with my ponytail and that was the life of someone who did not win the birth lottery um, simply because they were born at a different time in a different place and I started to continue to meet children and hear their stories and was completely overwhelmed by the numbers um, civil war really truly affects women and children and I could see that firsthand. In our world today, there are approximately 60 to 80 million orphan children and 300 million children worldwide not enrolled into primary school. <clears throat> In Nepal, a country the size of Louisiana, that stat was about 1 million children. But it was on a dry riverbed one day that that moment happened, my namaste didi moment. And um, in this trading post town called Sirket, there was a scattering of um, children on the side of a, of, of a dry riverbed <clears throat> that would sometimes fill with water as runoff from the Himalayan springs. And there were a few dozen children sitting on the side of the dry riverbed all day, every day, every time I would cross taking big rocks and crushing it into gravel to be sold for about a dollar at the end of a hard day's work. And um, one little girl in particular caught my eye, and she said, Namaste, Didi. Um, hello, big sister. And I just stopped in my tracks, and we locked eyes, and I thought, this little girl, her name was Hima. She could be me. And I basically thought, how would her life change if Hema could go to school, if she had access to education? Um, and as a little experiment, I talked to a local school and decided that for just $7, I could enroll Hema into elementary school. And this is Hema just a few weeks later. <laughs> so. Obviously, everything about Hema's life changes. Her smile, the lice gets cut out of her hair, she becomes the student with her backpack every day going to school. She's no longer alongside that dry riverbed, and what I call the addiction officially starts. <laughs> um, for just $7, you could enroll a child into school. They also need books and a backpack and a uniform and an admission fee and obviously a lot more support to remove those barriers. But when you do, um, you have very, very happy children whose trajectory of their lives completely change. Um, that's the beginning. But what I realized as I got into this work, I start learning Nepali, working with local government officials, reading every single book I can get my hands on for foreign aid and development. I formed a local board. I'm talking to the local people. I have a co-founder. And what I realized is that going to school is a distant wish. It's a big wish. But children couldn't dream of an education until their most basic human needs are met. Um, 
And what many children need is a place to call home, a family, a place to sleep, a warm bed, food in their bellies, medicine. Um, that was really the first step before thinking of the next step. So for $5,000, that's all I had from being a babysitter in New Jersey on that cul-de-sac. <laughs> I found out that there was a piece of land for sale for exactly $5,000. I thought it was meant to be. And it was my very first real estate investment. <laughs> um, this is me. I'm 19. And every good house needs a foundation. Uh, so the villagers and I start digging and drawing up plans for what would soon become a home. Now, in my reading, I started to see that those numbers that I talked about, they have a consequence. When, you, when, a, child, when a child and children are raised without food, without education, without knowledge, um, without safety and security, there's a consequence, and that is poverty and violence and war and cycles that continue and perpetuate. And I started to think that if we could care for our children, just a really basic concept, that maybe we could find peace in our world. And it started really simple. I went back and I started babysitting again, because <laughs> that's all I knew. I go back to New Jersey because that $5,000 is gone. I have lice in my hair. And I start babysitting, and little by little, $500 a week, sometimes some tips, plant sitting, dog sitting, I make enough money and send it back to build the shell of Coppola Valley Children's Home. And I wanted children to be raised the way that I was, with basic love and family and security and laughter and joy and music. And um, as I'm kind of dreaming this up and I can see it in my mind, I start to share my story. I was babysitting for a CEO who was like, you don't need to do this alone, you know. You can write a business plan and bylaws and you can form a board and there's this thing called a 501c3. So we do just that together with mentors and supporters. We create a board and I find people to teach me how to do this stuff. And um, in just six months with a lot of support, and everything from cupcake sales to garage sales to the biggest $500 check in the mail from a surprise neighbor. Um, in just six months, uh, we build the big, bright, yellow house, brick by brick. Um, this became Coppola Valley Children's Home. And today, I'm the adoptive mother of 54 children. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I wasn't planning on 55. I just had my first biological as well. Um, but it started with five, and then seven, and then 10, and then Coppola Valley soon became known for a place that raises children. And one of the only placement facilities for children in the Midwestern region, which is where the Civil War began. And everything about that vision, the swing set, and the marbles, and the kites flying in the sky, came true, and as children came in, I just watched them heal from each other, and being together, and dancing, and a family satsang every night. It was also with help, and like in the social entrepreneurship class today, deep-rooted mutual understanding with the community, so much so that they had complete ownership um, and investment in us, and a big part of the start was with local women who really cared about this cause. This is one of our first ever big family photos. <laughs> That's our family. Daughters first, and then little by little, some sons, and before you know it, you've got a whole house full of naughty five to seven year olds. <laughs> so, what is Copula Valley? It's a little slice of heaven. It's a place where you hear laughter, where there's dancing in the rain. Um, it's just pure joy. We go on camping trips <laughs> and have sleepovers. Actually, the biggest punishment at our house is that you have to sleep in your own room. 
<laughs> not in the bunk beds. And I found a life just filled with hardship and loss and you know, really hard work, but also love and joy and laughter and a job and a career that I love more than anything in the whole world. I feel so lucky. This is our family manifesto with my daughter Maya in a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> and what I like to say is that we are just like any other family. There's fights, there's um, rough housing, there's holidays and good food and a really long dinner table. We eventually had to have concentric circles. <laughs> um, my girls. The story sort of started to spread. Um, from babysitting to a cover with Taylor Swift in Cosmo Girl magazine and a Maybelline makeover, <laughs> um, which also came with a $20,000 prize where I could build more and more bedrooms. Um, and eventually the story was on the back of the Doritos bag, the Cool Ranch flavor, when I was 22. <laughs> One guy actually thought that I went missing. <laughs> And, and when he saw me back in New Jersey one summer, he had to ask. Um, but this came with a $100,000 prize, which I used to create Coppola Valley School out of bamboo, one of the most sustainable materials, also earthquake proof. Um, and we started working and, and especially targeting those group of, that group of kids breaking rocks. Um, Ten years later, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary at Blink Now. There is not a single child on that dry riverbed breaking rocks. They've all been enrolled into school. And this is my family <laughs> growing in their school uniforms. This is Coppola Valley today. I actually have teenagers and young adults now. That's what they make me call them. <laughs> And uh, Coppola Valley has become the top performing school, all with local teachers in the entire region. Um, it's, the kids are testing really, really well in other schools, and the country started to look at us as a model and as, as an example of what a school could be. Uh, for example, we were one of the first schools to outlaw corporal punishment, and following that, many other schools um, followed suit. This is just our amazing little nursery class. In any given year, we will have anywhere from 600 to 1,000 applicants, and we really have to comb through those candidates and find the most needful, the children who we don't think can succeed um, and are very at risk and very vulnerable and who we know can work wonders in our program and hopefully become change makers in the community. Uh, we also, uh, created the first ever girls soccer team. Twelve years ago there were no girls playing sports and this year our girls won the national championship. <laughs> so we were able to bring soccer to Nepal and to the girls and they'll be representing the, in the South Asia Cup. But even more exciting, today there are 14 other girls soccer teams in our region. Um, we're a place where anyone can come for food and a healthy, nutritious meal of rice and beans and fresh, fresh grown vegetables. Our model is different in that we try to grow a lot of our own food. We have cows um, and lentils and rice paddy where we try to sustain absolutely everything that we can and also teach the kids. One of the issues that I see in institutionalized and orphan care um, and foster care today is that there's an age out at the age of 18. So children in the system uh, often end up um, right back where they started, back on the streets. And if you think of, if you have your own children, just letting go at age 18, it's almost like abandonment. And so it's really important that we support our kids through that transitional period. So we do that through our school. We also created a women's center. Um, the program is really about going deep into the community and addressing all of the issues. So 
you can't have a school without clean water because the kids will just come sick. We launched a medical clinic because if you get a simple thing, infection or you're not immunized, that's another barrier that, barrier that can hold you back in the community. So making sure that we address both the basic, basic needs but also the bigger issues as a whole going really deep into the community. One of the things we started was a women's center um, which involves a 10-month vocational training program of business empowerment skills, uh, finance 101, and a vocational skill so that women can leave with income generation and the confidence to start their own business. This helps with their own children and in orphan prevention and also helps us take on a very family-first approach where we're supporting kids within their family so that the worst case scenario doesn't happen when they come into our home. Our latest initiative has been the Coppola Valley High School and our future campus, which is new and expanded. Um, we're setting out to build the greenest school on the earth with completely um, off the grid, self-generating energy like solar, a 200,000 uh, underground water, 200,000 liter underground water rainwater harvest system. Um, all of our waste is converted into methane and then used for cooking gas. We have a solar cooker as well and a lot of our own food growth. This is the campus built with some of the best Nepali engineers and architects and construction management team and people from around the world. This is our latest project this year. Um, personally, our family has continued to grow. We just got a new little girl two days ago. <laughs> um, we've transitioned 14 children out of our home who are living in independent living scenarios. Oh, this was incredible. <laughs> um, one of the hardest thing was that call to my parents because, I mean, imagine your daughter calls you and she's 18 and she's trekking through the Himalayas alone and then decides to stay there. And yeah, my parents were the ones that had to wire me my babysitting money. The hardest part for my mom was that I gave up on an opportunity to go to college and get an education. Um, and a few years ago, I got an honorary PhD in pedagogy. <laughs> Just <laughs> Which was re a really proud moment, especially for my mom. I think that was a really hard thing for her. Um, my parents always say, people always ask this question. I have a feeling I'd get it in this audience. Like, how did your parents say, do this? And my parents often say, like, yeah, we're considered the best parents ever for raising you now, but if anything bad had happened, <laughs> we would have been on CNN for being the worst, most neglectful parents of all time. And I really appreciate that and want to recognize them for supporting me, and now my children call them grandma and grandpa. Um, when I stand up here and give this talk, I, I want to make sure Yes, I'm this foreigner that came in from the outside, um, but it was really, truly a Nepalese effort. Our whole entire team is Nepali. We have 125 people who work with us, social workers, my own co-founder who was an orphan himself who moved back to Nepal from India, um, amazing cooks who cook with the kids, and social workers, and nurses, and doctors. It's truly a community effort in Sirket. And this year I got married. Everyone always said, how will you ever meet someone? <laughs> that was the other worry. <laughs> and I'd always get annoyed with that question because I was just in it and raising the kids and, you know, not looking. And sure enough, when you're not looking, you fall in love. I fell in love with a documentary filmmaker <laughs> named Jeremy. And we're making a film called Love Letters for My Children that will hit theaters hopefully in the coming years. And I had my first biological child named Ruby Sunshine. <laughs> so motherhood was not new, but giving birth certainly was. <laughs> and I had quite the trip, let me tell you. Um, but I've been back this summer to get her all of her immunizations. And we're gearing back to go to Nepal on Monday. So this was my very last stop to see you all and talk to you and share the story. 
Um, and why I speak um, is because education is everything. It's the answer. This is my daughter, Nisha, who I just dropped off at Stanford. <laughs> um, but not before she decided to take her very own gap year. <laughs> which was my motherhood surprise while I was on maternity leave. So it truly did come full circle. Um, so I stand here definitely not the oldest person in the room or the most wise, but definitely the woman with the most children <laughs> to say that we have got to join together um, to change this world not for us, but for our little ones here and everywhere. Um, and I think the first step in that is believing that it's possible. Believing that as grandparents, we can sit on our porch in our rocking chair one day and tell our children about the time of poverty and of violence and of children not having food to eat and a safe place to live. Our children are our most valuable natural resource. They are our everything. They are what I hold most sacred, and I think what you do too. And I think that we need to prioritize our children everywhere. We've advanced so far in technology and so far in what we've created in this world, and yet left so much behind. And I just want to say that we have to believe that we can do this and that we can be old one day on our rocking chairs talking about our history. Um, and please, please join me in that effort. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> You have such, such an incredible story to share. And we have so much to learn from you. Your message to start now and use what you have. Do you want to say something about that? Something, something more uh, to inspire us, to inspire the, the students that are here? Yeah, well, young people often ask, how can I do this work? And I say, well, you don't have to go 8,000 miles. You don't have to go on a gap year. You don't have to pack up your backpack and sacrifice everything. Um, but you do have to start with something, with that first step, um, with what your calling is. It can be the bees or the whales or gender equality or taking on race, racial issues or the environment, but you know what that calling is and to just take that first step of getting involved or making a contribution or listening to what that inner voice and where it's guiding you. Um, I often hear people say like, well, when I finish my degree, or when I have my PhD, or when I make all of the money in the world then, or when I retire, or um, after I meet my person, whatever it is, and it's, I, I find it to be like an excuse. And if we just started now with our interactions with each other, with our conversation, with how we spend our days, with our local community where we are, I think there would be a shift. And um, yeah, start with whatever you have, whatever skills and talents. And I think the part of my story that um, I was so young, I had nothing except for that babysitting money. <laughs> Luckily, I grew up on a cul-de-sac with lots of kids. <laughs> but because I had that, I had this young, like, I can do anything. I hate orphanages. I'm just going to create my own there's going to be music playing all the time. And like, it worked. Because I wasn't going to stand for anything else. Um, and now Coppola Valley is a model that's being looked at from around the world. Absolutely. It, and, and coming from Nepal, it definitely is. This, this, the story is, is a, a gold standard. Um, and I, heard, I first heard about Maggie back in 2009. Uh, someone that, that worked with you um, just said your name. The name stuck to me, and it wasn't a few years la later when uh, everything happened. You started coming up in the news uh, with all the awards, and that's when I truly started learning about you. Um, and it's an amazing story you have, a very positive story, but uh, one can only imagine the hardships you must have gone through. 
uh, in a different country with a lot of different things. And having followed you on, on social media quite closely, uh, I know of some of these hardships. What keeps you going? How do you persevere through all of this? Um, I think the option other than persevering would be to crawl under your bed and never get out. <laughs> um, and I said this today to the students, like on that riverbed, in that moment, it almost felt easier to do something than to just turn around and go back and forget it because that image would have haunted me forever. And I really truly think that it's easier to pick your head up and get out of bed, wipe the tears, get it out, and then keep going than it is to give up. Um, one, because I have those kids and I love them so much and I want a better world for them and I kind of can't give up. <laughs> when you have kids, you can't quit. Um, but yeah, I've been through so many hard things. For every silly award, there's, you know, hardship beyond measure where I thought, I'm, this is the end of me, I'm done, or this is just too hard, or this is just too difficult. And yeah, for the students in the room, it's true. You just have to keep going and keep getting better at what you do and keep learning. Um, that's why I haven't gone back to school and back to college. I just felt like if I'm still learning, then when I feel like I hit a barrier and I'm not learning anymore, then I'll go. And I've, it's been a learning journey every single day. Always reading a new book, always strategic planning, always thinking about scale and how we can take in the next kid and raise more money. It's like you're, you constantly just keep going. Now, now you say taking the next kid. And from our early conversations, I'm also aware that there is a wait list for, uh, for Coppola. And mm -hmm. It's one of the one of the only places um, in in the Midwest region of Nepal. What does that say about the situation? Yeah, I mean the need is so great, and you're just one person. And I find with childcare and raising kids, like people will give scholarships, they'll give a meal, but who at the end of the day is going to raise these children? And it's a whole next level of taking them on as your own and becoming ama. Um, and it's, it's our tough journey. And every year at admissions, it's choosing you know, the emergency case. And we're at a place now where we take emergencies. Like a landslide happens, a child loses their whole family, they're wiped out and a sole survivor. Or a terrible abuse case or a murder. Like it's real stories, real children, real faces. Um, and sometimes I feel like I'm reading the New York Times, but it's my life. And these are real kids. And it's, imagine if they're your child. I think we need to start looking at every child that comes to us as if they were our own, every story you read about, because they are our own. Um, but yeah, we just plan to keep going and sharing the story and being open source that more people can learn about us and do this work. And luckily, there's a whole next generation. A lot of them are sitting in this campus that are going to take on these issues. And we need them all. We need everybody. For sure. Now, I know I have so many burning questions, but <laughs> I should open it up to the crowd as well. Um, I know there are ushers around with mics uh, that, that would love to hand it over to you once you have some questions. Um, I'll just pick a few. We, have, we don't have time for too many. But if you have any questions, I see one hand in the middle right there. The, the lady in purple. Hi. Hi, my name's Emily. Um, I'm a senior in high school, and my question for you is, how did you overcome all the setbacks or roadblocks you encountered? Um, I would say collaboration, finding people who've been through the issues, like transitioning of um, young people. Like I called 10 other organizations and 10 other experts who'd been through transitional phase for kids and learning and learning. Um, also, when you're young, you, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I have to find a lawyer. Um, I, d I don't know finance. I had to find someone from Wall Street to like help and find a CFO and um, find people. And I think that if you ask me like, what's your superpower? One, it's that I think I'm good with kids, but two, it's just finding and attracting the right people. 
um, the right kind of supporters and the right kind of people that want to step up and help. And so I think, yeah, I think that's how you overcome hardship. You find people to teach and find people you can learn from, including a really good therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a hand back there. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm a sophomore here at Rollins, and I was wondering if you offer a program for like volunteering in Nepal for your orphanage? We do. Um, so we run something called the Coppola Fellows Program, and we look for young students, um, not only young students, everyone I should say, even experts in the field, teachers, educators, health workers, social workers. Um, we have a certain amount of positions each year that we open up. Um, sometimes people stay on for like, the longest has been five years. <laughs> um, and sometimes we ask for a five month minimum commitment just for that um, you know, consistency for the kids. And it's always working in collaboration with the Nepali director and Nepali leadership so that it's truly um, equal. And uh, we also run a short, we have some short volunteer periods for Desai in October, which is a Nepali festival when our Nepali's team goes on uh, leave for the holidays and also in the summer. Um, and occasional opportunities like internships for the Blink Now Foundation. So yeah, keep your eye out on positions. And I told students today that we'd love, love, love to have you. And I'm not sure if, if Giselda is in the audience, but I'm sure she would love to hear about that <laughs> as well. Uh, I have a gentleman up here. Thank you for taking my question. Mm -hmm. I think that I share the feelings of others in the audience. We're humbled. Mm, thank you. We're moved. We're inspired. And hopefully, we're motivated. But there was one thing that I was waiting to hear in this miraculous story. There seemed to be no mention of spirituality, mm. whether it be the people of Nepal or your own or that of the world. Surely I felt it was involved. Hmm. Good question. Um, so my children are Hindu and Buddhist. Um, Nepal is a, it's the Hindu capital of the world and it's also where the Buddha was born. Um, but my children take religious classes and theology and world cultures. Um, and as for my own personal faith, we were just talking about this today <laughs> with a religion professor. Um, I was raised of sort of, um, I would call it Unitarian, but not formally. My parents had Buddha statues in our garden and we celebrated Passover with our best friends up the street and we celebrated Christmas. Um, and uh, a lot of awareness about all religions. I think my own spirituality is constantly evolving and something I'm constantly exploring. Um, the lady right there. Hi, my name is Abby. I'm a sophomore in high school. And I was wondering how you gained credibility as a teenager, especially in a country that you weren't from. Mm. Um, great question. So on the US side of things, <laughs> one of our very first donors, like one of the very first bigger checks that I got, the wife was like, um, we have to give some money to this girl. And the husband was like, are you kidding? She's a teenager. No way. <laughs> Um, and they said, you know, like something about her, I just want to do it. And I would, I would attract that kind of person that was just like, no, there's something about her. I think she could do this. And if not, I believe in her anyway. Good for her for trying. Like that was kind of the beginning of the contributions that came in. And on the Nepal side, um, I think I was just very aware that I was young, that I was female, and that I was there to listen and there to learn as well and that we were doing it together. Um, and Nepali people are special. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. I'm not just saying that. Everyone who goes to Nepal says it. And there was something almost protective. Like 
people in the community wanted me to do well. They wanted to protect me. And I think I just sat and had a lot of tea with my neighbors and, you know, just really formed relationships. And there were really good government officials and really not so good ones. And I navigated that and learned. And I built a Nepali board um, with my co-founder. And yeah, just by the time I was really getting going, I was 21, so I came out of that teenager phase. Um, but yeah, I'm still only 31, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, I'm really young, and we're still succession planning and thinking about the future, and you have to create something above and beyond yourself, because something could happen to me. And I have children, so just like any parent or any founder, I'm constantly thinking of the future. Um. To, to your right, exactly, that, there. No, right behind you. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Sorry, you've been waiting for a while. <clears throat> Thank you, I appreciate it. So my name is Day, and I'm currently a junior here at Rollins College. Um, I was at your talk earlier this afternoon, and you mentioned suicide and depression being a problem over in Nepal, and I feel like it's also been becoming a worldwide issue and epidemic, and I'm just wondering, what steps should we take to save lives and also improve on them? Yeah, so that's a very depressing statistic. Um, and for those of you in the audience who don't know, suicide has emerged as the number one killer of women and girls childbearing ages in South Asia, Nepal and India in particular. Um, and it means that women are dying of hopelessness and the lack of mental health and the lack of um, getting support. And there's a lot of reasons to that, both culturally um, and amongst many other things. But it's a public health crisis. And I think we have to look at it as we would any public health um, crisis and a a attack it. Um, one hopeful statistic, women in Nepal used to, Nepal used to be the number one country in the world for childbirth, deaths related to childbirth and neonatal deaths. And we were the country that met our UN Sustainable Development Goals. These are goals that the UN sets every decade or so um, to be addressed worldwide, targets that we're trying to hit. And it was accomplished. We cut deaths, maternal deaths, drastically. And we did it with really simple things like training village midwives, a hand washing initiative, um, Public health experts found that women were covering the umbilical opening with cow manure. Um, there wasn't access to a simple, simple, like five rupee medicine to stop hemorrhaging. And there was a major training and initiatives that set out through Himalayan villages and it was successful. And there are many success stories in development. I mean, I paint a really dismal picture when we talk about those numbers and figures. <coughs> But we've also cut world hunger in half. Um, enrollment in, for women into primary school has gone up drastically in the last decade. Um, and that was incredible. So we're about to see a world um, more than ever before with literate and educated women who have a primary school education. And so for uh, mental health issues and suicide, I think we need to do the exact same thing. Um, look at what it's being caused by, study it, and then come up with a plan um, so that all of us development organizations can work together and collaborate. Um, and our Women's Center was created for that reason, of bringing women together, giving them coping skills, and creating a network of support. I have to be cognizant of everybody's time, so I'm gonna take two more questions. Um, up here. <coughs> Wait. wait a minute, wait a minute, let me give you a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, so much of an honor to hear you in person. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting Nepal when my oldest son, Ian, who's an alum with Casey, taught um, outside of Kathmandu for a year. And mm. I, you're right, the people are just the most beautiful people on earth. I work as a teacher, and so my question is, how can I help nurture in my students, you, you know, your kind of passion for, for, I work in a Catholic school, so it's a, there a little bit, but just trying to nurture that sense of that there's such a bigger world outside and, you know, what, what, you know, what can they do to mm -hmm. grow up to try to change things and make things better? Yeah, I think it's so hard to be a kid right now. 
because you can see everything for the first time. You can know what's happening right in front of you with social media and YouTube and Insta and Snapchat. And yet you can't, like it's hard to teach a kid how do I do this and I gave this example. When I was little, my parents used to guilt trip me every time I left food on my plate and they'd tell me about the starving children in China and I would look at them and be like, well, how can I give my food to them? It's right here. Can I give it to them? And there was this disconnect. And I think that that is the issue right now, is that we know about all of these problems, but you give money and you don't really know where it goes. I get to buy the school shoes and have the women make the uniforms and sew them and watch and see the impact, but that's a very... I'm lucky. Um, and... I think just trying to make it real and trying to create that connection um, and tell stories and tell stories and make those stories really relatable and that these are kids just like you um, and yeah just starting with each other there's some really good character education building and I do it with my kids now and lots of really good resources that I'd be happy to share. We have one back there. Hi, my name is Archana. Um, for the kids in the orphanage, do they stay in the orphanage or is there an adoption program that you have and how successful is that? Do the kids, you know, are they adopted at all? Uh, good question. So there's no international adoption um, and there's not a domestic adoption uh, service in place within Nepal, which is um, for several reasons. One, Orphanages um, were not regulated during the Civil War and neither was international adoption, so there was child trafficking um, and really, really serious issues that couldn't be monitored, so it was shut down. Um, so we're moving to children's home uh, care and there's talk about a foster care system coming into play. Um, but to answer your question about our home, no, you come in, we have permanent um, and full custody of our children and they don't begin the transition period until they're about um, 16 to 18 years old, and that's very slow. Like, you start when you're 16 by doing the grocery shopping and getting your own budget and your allowance, um, and it's starting to apply for scholarships and learning interview skills, and um, when you're 18, you have a little apartment with two of your siblings instead of 54. <laughs> And then um, a vocational training program or an internship uh, where you get to leave home for the first time. Um, and success looks different for all of our kids going through transition or who graduate from our school. For some, it's going international to a college or a university. For other kids in our program, success looks like making it to eighth grade. And then, you know, staying safe, not um, being married off as a child or uh, we run a safe house now for that purpose. Even with all of the programs we were doing, arts, music, after school program, prevention, assemblies, talks, we were still losing children to um, these terrible things. So success looks different, um, but we do stay with our children all the way into adulthood um, until they're on their first year standing on their own two feet with their first job and their first paycheck. Maggie will be around to take more questions after the official session's over. But Maggie, I, I, I'm having a hard time putting words into this, what I'm feeling as in, this is such an amazing story. And I'm sure a lot of us have this question now as to how can we be a part of this? How can we help? Um, so is there, is there a way that our friends in Winter Park and elsewhere, our faculty, the students, how can we, how can we help you? Uh, achieve success on what you're doing? There are so many ways. <laughs> um, one, just sharing our story on social media, following along, spreading the word. Um, you know, if you can give personally, um, we need to raise money each year to continue our programs and we have $238,000 to go on building this next big school. Um, that can be as simple as your babysitting money or hosting an event for your birthday and having friends over for dinner um, or just sharing it with a friend or a foundation. Um, and yeah, if you can come over, 
<laughs> to volunteer, young people. We'd love to have you. But yeah, share the story, tell a friend, follow along, give if you can. Um, we break everything down into little pieces, so you can literally buy a backpack or a school uniform or sponsor a woman or a child through our Roots program, which is our monthly giving, and we'd love for you to follow along and support. Thank you. Um, and a small message from our friends at the Winnipeg Institute. If you, if you can reach uh, Maggie's organization through all of that, but you could also reach them, reach her uh, through the Institute. So you can contact Gail, uh, and then we can, you, can, you can help in that way as well. Um, Maggie, just to close off, um, what's next for you? What's next for Blink now? Uh, what's next for, the, for this movement? So we are working until we are out of business in Nepal, <laughs> until there's no child in need and no child that needs a place um, to call home and a family. Um, but secondary to that, we want Copula to be an open source learning model um, so that we can take on other people who want to do this work and we can teach them how to do it and develop our blueprints and then share them. That could be something like downloadable where you go to our women's center, um, download this is how we did it and then you can take that or pieces of that that may work for you. Um, it's an interesting collaboration with Rollins because we're all about empowering other social entrepreneurs. I don't want to up and like put another flag in um, Sri Lanka or Somalia or you know one of these other places. I really want to teach and enable and learn um, and work with other people so that we can scale up in that way. What, is, what an amazing, <laughs> amazing story and what an amazing evening this has been. Um, everyone, if you could join me in thanking Maggie for Thank all that. You. <laughs>